Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. <sighs> We've been watching you all morning and last night. It's been so fun. <laughs> oh, thank Are you, you so tired? Well, I am now after my dance lesson. I thought oh my I was God. doing all right, but whew, that took the wind out of me. Roman was dancing with you guys. <laughs> oh, it was Roby. so cute. Roby. So how are you guys doing? We're doing great. I mean, I think. You think? I don't know. I mean, it feels like it's okay mm -hmm. some days. And today feels like one of those days. So go with it. Go with it. Yeah. Yes. Well, we are here. We got to tell them who, who you are, what we're doing here. You're not just my post dance lesson talk buddy. It's my cousin <laughs> Heather of the Million Person Project and uh, co author of a wonderful book called How Your Story Sets You Free. Yes, I was hoping you'd have it. a little prop there handy. How your story sets you free. So um, I don't know. Why don't you talk a little bit uh, to the people, and I'll come back and ask you some questions. And right? just give tell them what you do. Okay. Yeah. So this book is about how to tell your truest personal story publicly or to other people. It's really about when we own all parts of who we are and we're willing to stand in that truth and allow other people to see us in that, we believe that that's where our personal and collective liberation comes from. When we're willing to be like, this is my story, I own it. I didn't choose actively all of it, um, but this is what I've made it mean and this is how I've navigated it, that there's extraordinary power in that. And so that's what we do. We work with people all over the world. To, that's our job is to support them in telling their truest personal story. So lots of people speaking on the TED stage, lots of people um, testifying for things, lots of people, um, artists and musicians and people who, are doing work that are that is deeply meaningful to them and they want to be able to express that you know in words. And so it's pretty awesome we've worked with 3000 people from 70 different countries and what we understand is that you know of all of these diverse people doing different things in the world most people fall on sort of one extreme of the spectrum is either like, I don't really feel like I have a story mm -hmm. or my story feels too sad, too personal, too much. I wouldn't know where to, I don't know where to start. I don't know why people would want it, you know? And so we kind of work with people from either end of that spectrum to build them into a place where they're, they're fully um, owning their story and, and able to articulate it in a way that makes them feel like more like themselves. Mm -hmm. And what's the, I guess, why would, why would anyone want to tell their story? What's the end goal? Here? Well, I think the, the bigger end goal, like we all have this yearning to be seen and to be ourselves. It's just part of, to be seen for who we actually are. A lot of us create this idea that we have to be somebody else in order to function in this society. And that's not a crazy thing to come up with because our society sucks in a lot of ways, you know? And we do tell people to cut off certain parts of them and don't share this and don't share that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like a internal sort of pull to want to tell your story and be yourself. And then I think a lot of people also want to tell their story because it's helpful to find their people, you know? So if they're building an audience of, of like-minded people or musicians, or it, when you tell your story about the deepest held values that you have as a person, that 
that helps people find you in a deeper way. Like they, you, you can feel if you resonate, they can feel if they resonate with you. But if you're right. just up there talking about things you don't really care about, it's hard for people to find you, you know? But what about, what if I have a fear of oversharing? Yeah. I mean, to what end though? The fear is that if you overshare, like, you know, what will happen? People will lose interest. People will think I'm needy. People will, um, you know, it's like asking for donations for a festival one too many times. <laughs> <laughs> People will stop hearing what I have to say. Yeah. And, and it's legit, you know, it's a legit fear. And, some people will stop listening when you tell your story because of whatever is inside of them, mm -hmm. you know, but my sort of, you know, argument philosophy, like what I, my, what I, what I see reflected back to me in the world, because it's what I believe already is that when you share your, personal story and you do the work to really find the parts that are most meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. So literally when you're talking, you're experiencing yourself as, you know, inspiring, empowered, whatever it is that you, you know, when you are your first audience member and your story is that meaningful to you, it's mm -hmm. really hard for people to turn away. What, what, what happens is that people don't know which parts of their story to tell and they kind of do it as a like getting off the chest thing or like a frantic energy. And so they come with their story in a way that makes um, the audience not know where they're going or what, mm. the, you know, and, and, and so it's really, it really is like an energy thing. Like you have to believe that your story is really meaningful and valuable. And that's a lot of the back work that you have to do before right. getting on stage. Because when you do, other people will, will feel that same energy. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and there's actually like neuroscience to back that up. <laughs> This is scientific evidence. Yeah, there is. Like when you share something that is meaningful to you and emotional to you, it sinks in the brains of the audience member. Right. Well, that makes sense. And they actually even did it with people who weren't speaking the same language. Really? And it happened. Because well, I guess it would be just body language. Yeah, we can feel. Yeah. You know, we can like feel that. Yeah. I want to come back to this, um, what you said about, you know, when you're telling your story on stage. But first I want you to share with us your story and what, what, why you do this. Yeah, I mean, I think ever since I was like a little tiny person in the world, and it's interesting because I have a one-year-old now and I'm watching him and how much just innate you know, sort of energy he puts on a certain path. Um, so it's been so interesting for me to get to watch him grow like that and then reflect on myself. But ever since I was, you know, so small, my desire to feel connected was really strong. And I believed that sharing my sort of deepest thoughts was the best way to get connection. I remember if you're, I remember saying to myself, if you're scared of something, just say it out loud and then it's not scary anymore. And as a kid, this was an interesting kind of philosophy in my family where we don't really talk about a lot of things, the hard stuff in my family, you just kind of, you know, smile and hope that everything is going to turn out okay. And so 
I tried a different route where I would be like, you know, I'm afraid Gigi's going to die. <laughs> and it didn't oh, always go yeah. over well in my family, but it made me feel like at least I have my, like, at least what I feel the most um, at least I'm not hiding anything. And I think that's what it comes down to. And I've been working, I'm reworking on my story now. And I feel like there really is like this idea of risking something for connection. Like we all want connection. We all want different levels of whatever we define success or connection or you know, to be seen in the world, but we have to risk to do that. And what are you willing to risk in order to find that connection? And really that's what I feel like my life's work is about. So you, you said uh, you would say what if Gigi's gonna die. It's your, your, your grandmother. My great grandma. Yeah. Your great grandma. Yeah. So just facing the fear and putting it into words and then taking the, the power of the fear out of it. Yeah. But the thing is, is that I was really, really riddled with anxiety and I still work with that. And so it doesn't actually work for me to, it doesn't like take the fear out of it for me. It just makes me feel like more in integrity with myself and also mm. more in relationship with like not an abstraction of the fear mm -hmm. of like running through my mind, running through my mind, but it's like, Hey, I'm in relationship now with this fear with other people. Right. And that like, that's kind of like the, um, that that's like my pathway to a, a more grounded spot for me to stand. So, I mean, it sounds like before it said it was going to come back to the, you know, being ready to tell your story on the stage, you would think that, and, you, and because you mentioned TED Talks, you would think that your book or what it is that you teach would be designed for people who are into, or specifically for people who are into public speaking or uh, senators or, or, you know, uh, actors or, or um uh, community leaders, but when you talk about it from the fear um, standpoint, the story you just told, then it's it seems like it could be useful for anyone to kind of get in touch with their with their story. But but why do people want to do it? I mean, what sort of people come to you and say, "I need your help. I want to tell my my truest version of myself." So a lot of people are carrying untold stories. So that's, and, and, and we get a higher percent, like to me, according to the world, I mean, according to my view of the world, if I just thought that the people who I interacted with was the sample set of the world, mm -hmm. I would be like everybody in the, on the planet, like has, survive some extraordinary thing that they're not that they're not telling anyone <laughs> because those are the people that call me is like i have this deep deep story that i've never told anyone i haven't even told my mom she was there you know or this life defining experience of coming out to my parents like i really want to tell that story and i know that it has a role in the world for my generation but i I'm tongue tied. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I feel like I'm just going to cry the whole time. Um, or like, you know, I'm a badass leader and I speak, you know, I speak here and there and I travel all over the world. And, uh, you know, a few weeks out of the year, I can't get out of bed because of depression or whatever, you know, like however people are, yeah. you know, and that, having people 
come to me and, and say that and say, I want to tell this story because I don't want people to think that you have to be a bad, in order to be a badass leader, you have to have your depression under control. Right. You can be, you know, and so that's why there's this, there's a, everyone that works with us. And I think that buys our book is like, there's this longing to get free mm -hmm. and to be honest and to be of contribution to like, make our world somewhere that's more representative of who we truly are, you know? Wow. Yeah, that's scary. That's scary. I mean, just listening to you say that is scary. That sentence is scary. That's uh, There's a lot of responsibility, and what if I get it wrong? Yeah. yeah. What, if I, what if I tell the story the wrong way, and or people take take it the wrong way and misinterpret me and all of a sudden I find myself the leader of the next Jonestown you know inadvertently <laughs> I don't know why that was I mean that's my first fear but <laughs> I mean that's a real big leap you know but it's it's like the thing about it is that people are going to take it the wrong way yeah. So, and, and like, that's the thing I'm always telling my clients It's just like, yes, that fear, uh, you know, that fear that you have, the fear that I have of being like the over emotional white lady that's just like spouting off about be yourself and unity and blah, blah, blah. And that's all people are going to think I am. Yeah, <laughs> it is like, uh, you know. Some and some people are gonna like, you know, roll their eyes and shut off the the video because of that. Mm -hmm. And other people are gonna be like, "All right, I I'm listening," you know. Mm -hmm. And other people are gonna be like, "I've never been able to hear that from somebody else until I heard it from her." Mm. And that's where I believe our responsibility comes from. Is that from Amelia Ray's unique voice, your story coming from your unique voice will resonate with somebody else in a way that even if you feel like, oh, this message has already been said before, somebody will hear it from you in a way they never have before. And they will be able to see themselves in you in a, in a way they haven't seen themselves in someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's not about telling that story for them like, it's not like if you don't want to do it yourself, then you should do it for someone else. Not at all. Like, first, tell it for yourself. Hmm. But don't deny the reality that your story is going to support somebody else's liberation also. Like, that's just true. I mean, it's my opinion, actually. <laughs> it's not true. It's my opinion. But it, I just believe it and see it happening so much. And I feel like so many people cut themselves off because they're like, oh, I'm kind of in the middle of my story, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like, it's not really done yet. I don't have one of those stories. And those are the stories we need the most because once you have it all, once you're Oprah, right. and you're like, I survived my <laughs> sexual assault and I'm Oprah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, but you're Oprah. <laughs> It does help some, like it does help shift culture to be like, Oprah said it, I can say it. Right. But there's another layer of empowerment that comes when, when somebody isn't totally like, you know, yeah, complete with that. When they're, when they're, when they're in it with you, they're in the trenches with you. I mean, they're, or they're still, go, you know, it feels like they're still going through it, no matter what stage of their story they're at. Do yeah, and think this is my this is one of my favorite quotes in the book. It is um, better to be hated for what you are than to be loved for what you are not. Haters gonna hate. Haters he said that. It's, it's actually it was a Kurt Cobain. Um, he said um, it, but actually, Andre Gide or whatever I can't pronounce his name, which is why I never read, in our read G. I never read this in our book readings because I'm like Andre and. <laughs> But it's better to be hated for who you are than love for who you are not. And that's like, blah, blah, blah. You can see that as one thing. But really, like, loved for who you are not? Like, I'm going to be more 
palpable, palp palpable. <laughs> I'm going to be more accepted in the world because I'm being not my whole self. And if I was my whole self, that would be more complicated for other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's just like, to me, that's so, so motivating. It's just like, it's not about being hated for what you are. Cause that makes me uncomfortable. Like the word hate, you know, mm -hmm. but being loved for what I am not like, I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want the, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that for other people. And I don't want to be the person loving someone you know, because we all hold each other in and there there might be somebody in the world that says, oh, yeah, but I could never tell Heather that. And I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anybody wants to be. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Really. Um, what was I going to ask you? Do you think that we are all saying the same thing? Basically, yes. I mean, I, you know, what, what this story work is, it's about values. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really about what do you deeply believe is true, Amelia? Like, what is the thing that you would stand for all the way? What's the value? You know? Mm -hmm. Rock and roll. And what? Rock and roll. And yeah. Okay. So then it would be like, and so what I mean by that is, you know? Yeah. And then you go and go and you, and when you go and go and go and go, like you eventually arrive at love. Uh -huh. Almost everybody. I mean, kind of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just like, I believe in love. And so I feel like people's stories a lot of times are just a testimony to how love can prevail over extraordinary, like extraordinary adversity. Hmm. And we're all getting to see each other's different kind of articulations of that and lenses of that. And for some people, like one of my central values that I believe in with all of my heart is that our stories are not about what happened to us or about what we did. It's about who we've chosen to be given that. So there's no way to be like defined by the worst thing you've ever done or the worst thing that's ever been done to you. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be defined by what happened. You can only be defined by who you've, who you've chosen to be. Right. And I do believe that that's, you know, that's some variation of love. But that's, I mean, liberating as it may sound, that's also terrifying. Because let's say, I, as long as I'm a victim, then my role is clearly defined. And now if you say that I can choose what I want to do with my experience. I could choose not to be a victim. Well, that's not so defined anymore. That's not as clear cut and easy. I mean, that first of all, there are far too many options. Um, if I don't define myself as a victim, there's a chance I might be uh, an aggressor, an oppressor, which is terrifying, you know, um, or just just losing your your definition of self as victim. I mean, where do you go from that if it's something that you've carried around, or you know how you define yourself for years? So that's it's terrifying what you speak. This book sounds terrifying. Don't read it before bed, children. <laughs> no, but it, you know it, it. You have. I think most people, though, and most it's not most people who are a victim it's like we're in our, every single person in our in our lives somewhere we're identifying or have identified as a victim mm -hmm. and I think what we most know in those parts of ourselves is that there is like an inkling to set that down there's like a little tiny like 
voice sometimes. Sometimes it's like really loud and like being like, stop being like that. It's damaging you. You're getting sick or like, you know. Yeah. But I think even with the, the quietest of, of, of those voices still kind of not you to be like, does this, is this true? Mm. You know, it's not even like, does this serve you? It's like, is this true? Are you actually, are you a victim or are you really, really powerful and resilient or are you powerful and healing or are you um, beat down, but still here? Um, and maybe, maybe that doesn't need to be Maybe you can be beat down and still here and not be a victim. Like Celie in the color purple. I don't, I don't know. All right, cousin, <laughs> we got to have a color purple session. <laughs> um, all right, I want to ask you a ridiculous question before we do our promo out. It's kind of like lightning round that I started last night with Lauren Flans. But I didn't oh, have any hilarious. question in mind. When's the, she is hilarious, was not she? When's the last time you went bowling? Um, in Philadelphia with Julian right before I got pregnant, which was like 2018. Wow. And uh, who won? I, I mean, I can't remember, but of course me. <laughs> 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 you want to chime in there, Julian? <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, that's one thing we got to do when they when they open the gates again. We we got to go bowling. Is there yes. like Tanferan or something? Is there a the what alley? in Tanferan? Is there a bowling alley? What's Tanferan? What do you mean? What's Tanferan? The the mall in in San Mateo or Bert right there? Oh well, um, I don't know, but there's a really awesome bowling alley in the. Presidio that has really good mozzarella sticks too. Oh, um, all right. I could go a mozzarella stick, not two, yeah. but one. One. I, <laughs> I like jalapeno poppers because they get cold. Yeah, now you're talking jalapeno. Yeah, Once when the get cheese cold, gets cold, you know, it's over. It's over. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I have to they, say one quick thing before we go. Yeah, we were gonna say a, we record things. a lot of videos for our. Um, classes and stuff and so we have to speak into a video like you know mm -hmm. but be sincere and blah 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 and be and before we always turn on the video i always say your cousin amelia and then we push play because when we talk to you in the videos and we we talk to you about telling your story and we talk to you about how much this work means we just feel like we're on message and we're like we bring our full selves to it. So, what do you mean? Like we, mean? we, we state the audience member that we're talking. Oh, to I see. So that we are sincere. Like it. Like we're not talking into a video. We're talking to cousin Amelia. Right. About I the story you. work, and we're gonna like hammer her about telling her story right now, and how yes. important it is to the world, and how much yes. power she has, and how important that voice is. You know. And so, uh, we, uh. <laughs> so it I helps us get really fired up and not hold back and not trying to like be appropriate for the video. We're trying to like get a Talk to skip to the person. Yeah. So when I have my next guest on after you, I should be like, yo, Celeste. I shouldn't be like, oh, and where are you calling us from? I'd be like, I know where you live. Don't make me come over like that. No, you should just value your own story and and go huge with your leadership which i uh, see you doing I, I i'll try it's still it's a challenge man i'm still i'm afraid but you know yeah but you're so powerful <laughs> and you come from a lineage of storytellers you know yeah really bold storytellers yeah yeah that's true i gotta i gotta keep up my end of this game here um well, thanks. Now I've got something to think about in our, our whatever this is. Eight, oh, it's right there. 18 and a half. 
tell the people where they can find you. Um, on Instagram, Million Person Project. And then our website's millionpersonproject.org. Cool. And you, you are Heather Box and... What? Who's the other person? You oh, Julian right? Rossine McQueen. <laughs> so I was like, is this a trick question? Joan? No. <laughs> I was like, I do. I do have another Instagram for my wine expert. <laughs> We're going to have to talk about that now. Okay. Yes. Cousin to Heather go. and Julian, thank you so much for having this conversation with me and, and uh, yeah, bringing some bringing some real talk to our music festival. It's like, I feel like we went into the, you know, a side tent, like the techno <laughs> music's playing over there and maybe, you know, some metal band, there's a mosh pit and too many mushrooms or something. We just kind of went into a chill spot. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> we have uh, an update here, bowling score. Oh, I know. I was thinking about it. He probably did actually win. Yeah, I'm going to say, you but, can go in the other room. I'll let you two duke that out. Thank you I so know, much. I always feel like I'm winning. even Well, I'm you should. You should. Yeah. That's you Stand in your power. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. Love you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.